Hello and welcome to Stampscaping 101. This is a publication from 1999. Rubber Stamping for the First Time by Carol Scheffler, Arts and Crafts contributor to Today on NBC. I have some uh, pieces that I did here in the back in the kind of the artist portfolio section. Um, but for the most part, this is a beginning book, or it is a beginning book on the media, what are stamps? What are the tools that are used with it? What are some different methods for coloring stamps, um, embossing, brayers, watercolors, etc.? Um, how much does it cost to get started? You know, in stamps. You know, so it talks about the different media, the average price for a stamp, wood mounted stamps back then, and uh, I don't know. It's just everything for the beginner. And it was a really cool book at the time. Now, one of the things I thought would be fun is just to go through some of these really beginning techniques um, uh, and just go through, you know, some of the basics in application with Stampscape stamps. So maybe I'll use a set or something like that, but we'll show how to color images. I've done all these different types of techniques in different videos, but maybe we'll do it in a little bit more of a concise method following um, kind of the structure of this book for the most part. Now, I don't know if I'm going to do everything. Some of it's just way too beginner, but I don't know. Maybe we will go through with it, you know, so it's like how to color, you know, a stamp with a marker and stamp it out and how to utilize, you know, a, a stamp pad and then stamp it out. I don't know if we need to go into something as basic as that, but um, we'll go into some of the things at least, you know, that are a, a step up from doing something like that. And we'll see how it goes, okay? So anyways, rubber stamping for the first time. So maybe you can think of it as stampscaping for the first time and whether or not you utilize some of these techniques or not, I don't know. Maybe some of them are too basic. You know, we've come a long way in stamping since then. But um, I don't know, a lot of the basics still apply and I still utilize them all the time with my, um, I don't know, techniques. And a lot of times people think my techniques are like really uh, kind of extensive and vast, but you'll find them in this book right here, but maybe just done in a kind of an abbreviated way where I might combine several of these techniques into one scene. But they're all very basic. That's why I call this channel Stampscaping 101. They're not, uh, it's not Stampscaping 401 or something like that, you know, like a master's class or something of that sort. So we'll find it all in this book, and then let's see what it looks like um, applied to the uh, scene. Okay, technique number one. How do I ink a stamp with a marker? I don't think we need a lot of help with that one, so, but let's, let's do that anyway. But let's kill two birds with one stone. How do I ink a stamp with a marker? And we'll combine it with, how do I use markers to achieve a multicolored effect and or watercolor look with markers, okay? Now the markers that we're going to be talking about are water-based dye markers, okay? Another word for those are watercolor markers, right? So let's just color the this stamp up right here. It's a deciduous uh, aspen tree, okay? So let's just stamp it out. Okay, so if someone's just thinking about uh, aspens in the fall, they're thinking yellow, okay? So let's just do it just in straight yellow. Okay, this one's kind of a brilliant yellow right here. Okay. And I'm coloring all the foliage up using yellow, okay? Now, if you're using markers like this, I, I guess if you use pads too, you can just ink it up with a pad and then you can ink up the trunks a different color if you want to. Um, what color would we do that in? Let's just do it in, let's do it in like a, Oh, I don't know. Let's go with the, I mean, we'd be doing it in white, but you can't, you know, we're not going to use like a, a white pigment ink on something like that. So I usually go with the color, then I'll add in some other white types of effects later on, maybe. Okay, but this is just going straight coloring, like um, just going for different sections here. <laughs> that is yellow, that is brown, that there's nothing else in between there, okay? So let's just stamp that out as is, okay? We'll just go like this. Okay, large stamps with a lot of surface area. I was just mentioning this to someone 
that uh, didn't wasn't getting um, a center uh, impression stamped out very well with a very large stamp and I just said you approach it like one two three and then top bottom or something like that don't rock your stamp or something like that and have an adequate amount of cushion underneath there now if you're using a platform or something like that same thing you might be closing your platform and pressing 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 but press directly over your image and you'll get that complete um, impression in the center areas otherwise the pressure goes all the way on the perimeter like that okay all right so that looks you know that looks okay and I don't know how I got that little bit of variation in there there might have been some other tone on there okay but let's go for that watercolor approach that they talked about okay so let's go for a little bit more blending on here okay so let's take this same oh this is an olive brown like this okay this one happens to be pretty dry and I'm going to go right up the trunk with this like this okay now there are some other branches in there but I'm doing that okay so this is your watercolor type of look okay these are big fat um, brush markers from Marvy okay and they're really great for this type of look right here all right so what I'm doing is I'm going in here and I'm blending into some of that elongated trunk stroke that I put in there okay so you're doing this and I'm coloring it this is usually how I would color an image like this okay I usually just don't go for one uniform um, application of one color okay I usually use multiple colors especially if it's a fall tone like this when I do this directly on the pad like or on the stamp like this I just I have less work to do afterwards with my coloring okay all right so that is that yellow right there but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in you know a couple other colors touches okay so let's say um, this is a fall toned um, image okay and the colors are turning I'm let's bring in a little bit of this green where it hasn't turned quite yet okay you know to all completely yellow I added that in there but now I'm going back in with a lighter tone to blend it out okay so you kind of go back and forth um, with your colors like this okay just to blend otherwise it's a little bit harsh in terms of the overall look okay it's you can't always tell exactly how an image is going to stamp out to just by the looks of it when doing this type of blending as well so you just kind of play around with it a little bit and then what I usually do these days is I use my paint pens to go back in and give it more of a shimmery type of texture but let's just check out this let me stamp this one a little bit higher so we can see more of those trunks here plenty of pressure okay right and you get that varied look like that okay you see those and that's where it overlapped of course that one doesn't look too bad either but I get a lot of variation like that and then when I would add in I'll do something with this card after a while, um, after I'm done with these um, kind of exercises but then I would go in with an acrylic paint pen and add some shimmery looking um, textures right over the top of this okay so this provides me a foundation for some extra tone but I mean this looks good as is too all right okay so that is stamping and coloring with um, pens okay let's go for some of that coloring type of uh, basic coloring um, I don't know whatever section in the book and let's use this covered bridge number 318i it's just a big image and there's plenty to color in if i stamp out something like this there's nothing to color in because it's a solid image so i'm coloring in you know or i'm coloring the object itself before stamping it but something like this has some open area in it so i can color it in afterwards like using some chalks if i can find some colored pencils um markers and uh what else did it say watercolors okay that should be interesting okay 
So, that being said, what I'll do is I'll do one of these and I'll do the other four off camera, okay? All right, so going with that same form of coloring right here with the markers, okay? Now, I, I, I'm just going to expedite the process right here. A lot of um, dye base pads worn out at the time, so they don't have, you know, a lot of the pads being used. I noticed there was um, some vivid pads in that book. And if you know Vivid, I was talking about someone about uh, with someone about Vivid recently, and about how we really like the uh, the fabric of those pads. Those ones were really fantastic. Those ones were by Clear Snap, and those were some of the real early dye based pads. Okay, so I laid down a brown in here, and I'm adding in some um, green into here. But let's go for some yellow tones in here. I don't know, maybe this is a bad idea. <laughs> There's a lot of juicy inks in here, but I'll see if I can get some variation. I don't know if they'll, I'll get the same variation from all four of these um, uh, layouts that I'm doing here, because there's going to be a lot of variation with all of these colors right here. I'm going into a very dark color in comparison, by contrast, with this yellow here. So you notice how I'm kind of rolling out the marker after I lay down some of those inks in there, okay? All right, so I'm going for a little bit of a different color scheme in here. Usually I do these deciduous trees kind of in more of a, you know, reddish-orange type of um, color scheme. But let's go for... Um, a little bit of a different color scheme this time, where the greens and yellows may be indicating a different type of deciduous tree there in the background. Okay. And th again, this is a very large stamp, so plenty of pressure. I'm adjusting my pressure going from left, center, right, top, bottom, okay? And then I do it again like that. All right, and we have those multicolored tones there inherent in the impression itself. Get this brown right here and some greens and yellows in the background. You don't see a lot of yellow because it mixed with a lot of the green and brown in the background there, but it's a multicolored tone and impression. Okay, so I'll go for um, f uh, three more of these ones and then we'll look into the different coloring um, styles. By the way, this one right here was on glossy cardstock because I wanted a nice vivid um, impression, okay? Now, I want vivid impressions on this too, but I can't go with the glossy on this one if I'm going to be using something like chalks, um, colored pencils to some extent, and uh, that watercolor. The watercolor wouldn't be good. You know, watercolor painting wouldn't be good on something like this. As a matter of fact, maybe for the watercolor painting, I don't know, maybe I should do just stamp something out in like a stays on or something like that. But let's just see how it goes. And uh, let's see if heat setting is enough. Okay, so I'll go off camera with the rest of these. Okay, I've made four different impressions with our covered bridge here. And um, they're four multicolored impressions using the pens as kind of that um, water type color type of effect. All right, and I thought what we would do is we would do more of this watercolor look here. I don't know if it's so-called, you know, if these really look like watercolors unless you're just thinking of the, uh, the dye-based pens as, a, you know, kind of a potential split fountain type of, uh, uh, I don't know, vehicle by which to get those multi-toned images. But that being said, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize um, some additional images in this watercolory type of look here. And what we'll do is I will use the maple um, leaves here and we'll get that different type of color, um, I don't know, color, color blend, I guess you can call it. All right, and let's go in here like so. Getting some different colors. Now the way that I'm doing this, I mean, I am going to get a lot of different variation because, as you can see, I mean, there's a lot of variation that can happen with this type of blending here. And we're talking about a lot of different impressions here. 
um, to create this look that we're going after. All right. You can see all those different colors within that um, one impression right there. Now, it's going to be different from um, card to card because of that variation. So just keep that in mind. I mean, you might get something that you really like, and then you might think, I want to get that exact same thing. Um, it's possible if you do this really methodically um, to get that look, but... I don't know. I think it would be really difficult to achieve that. So personally, I don't even try. I just kind of blend things together and I can see how it's kind of blended on here. I mean, I can have a, a decent idea if it's going to be more of a, a darker green or a yellow or something like that based on the, uh, the colors that, you know, are, I can see are visual here, but I don't know. I think it's just kind of best to go into it and just say, you know, in some ways, whatever happens, happens, okay? All right, so just going coloring around, like about like so. This one was going to be more orange because I didn't blend in some of those other colors, but there was um, some color that um, was retained from the previous impression, okay? I could see it right on the rubber itself, so not... Uh, you know, concerned about that. Okay, three impressions, that's pretty good right there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do this type of um, same overhanging um, type of uh, foliage format on these other three. And then um, we'll take a look at that. Maybe we'll build a little bit more structure around here with uh, maybe a couple more impressions, but then we'll get on to the coloring portion of it and check out these four different um, methods of coloring that they mentioned in this uh, book. All right, we have four different compositions with that um, maple overhang in them. Now let's uh, finish off some of the um, lower portion of this card um, with uh, some additional texture. I, I mean, I could leave it open and leave it open for like a quote stamp or something like that, and I think that would be pretty cool too. Uh, but let's go ahead and finish this off in terms of... Uh, Imagery, I'm just going to be using some brown ink, and this is the Sedge filler that comes with the um, set here. And I'm just adding in some additional texture like that um, right along the road right here. I'll, I'll leave the road kind of open like that um, for some additional... Um, uh, we can leave it open for some texture, or we can just leave it as is and... Um, uh, just have it as what I call a visual lead-in, meaning there's just kind of a blank area in which the viewer, from a, a viewing standpoint, can enter the scene um, compositionally. Okay, it's good to leave kind of some open area for the, our viewers to kind of, I don't know what you call it, I, I guess it's kind of like an emotional entrance. Because... When you're kind of looking at a scene like this, in some ways, I think subconsciously we were entering the scene and going into it. So having this kind of open area down below is a really good area to, um, it, it kind of welcomes the viewer as opposed to having like a gate across this or bushes across that where you can't enter. It's very welcoming and it kind of pulls the viewer in and again from you know, maybe a subconscious, or you can call it an emotional standpoint, where we feel compelled to enter the scene um, that way. Okay, now, just going back to those, you know, that where we are on this, kind of this beginning, you know, stamping for the first time book. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go in and make impressions using some stamp pads here. I'm not going to take the time to color this read stamp up. Oops, there's a little crystal from a previous video. All right, now what I'm going to do here with this Reed's large stamp is I'm going to stamp it in green like this, okay? Now we're going to do it in a couple different layers though, okay? We'll give it a little bit of additional um, kind of body and depth by doing it in two different colors. Now this green right here is very, very dark. It's 
just about the darkest green that I know of in stamping it, and it's called Bottle Green. And it's the number 25 green from Marvy. Um, 25 is the ink number, okay? So we have that. I'm not going down here because see this road's coming around here. I mean, I could put some right there, but I'd still like to leave a little bit of an opening, again, for that visual lead-in. Okay, so that's bottle green. And what I was mentioning is the, um, the dual um, value right in the foreground. So what we'll do is we'll go with black here and I'll do it a little bit off center, okay? <laughs> I mean, you might end up stamping right over, um, exactly over you know, like a previous green impression of it. But for the most part, I'm trying to make it a little bit offset. So do you see that little value change in here? See, that creates depth within your foreground by having something darker and something lighter than that, okay? I don't think this is like, a, like an advanced technique. This is not an advanced technique doing that, okay? <laughs> a lot of people, I don't know, people that haven't done this before think, they're kind of thinking about the end result, thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I can't do that. This is easy stuff, folks. These are beginning techniques right here as proven by stamping for the first time. <laughs> Hopefully, I mean, when we give our cards to someone, you know, we don't want them thinking, oh my gosh, what an easy card to make. You know, that's not the response you want. You want, you know, them to be kind of appreciative of the work that you put into it. But I don't make my stamps or any of my techniques to be something that's difficult to do. I can talk anyone through this. And we used to have five-year-olds at our demo tables all the time doing the same thing that adults were doing. You know, because people would bring their kids to conventions. If you don't believe it, uh, I don't know. You can ask around. <laughs> because some people would park their kids at our booth and say, Okay, you're going to be here? All right, we'll be back in like a half an hour or something like that. Then we kind of said, okay, you know, if you're gonna do, you know, if you're gonna do a demo, you have to get your parent next to you. Otherwise, we were kind of like kid daycare. But hey, they were doing all the scenes and uh, all the different techniques, and uh, no problem. Okay, so we have our compositions largely made up here and built. So we're gonna do one in um, like chalks. I don't have chalks, so I'm going to have to do some pastels, unless I can find some chalks. Then we're going to do some colored pencils. I'm still wondering what I'm going to do about pens, though, okay? Because I don't have some Tombow pens, and I'm not going to color the scene with something like a big, wide Marvy tip, you know, paint, you know, brush marker like this. And then watercolors. Now, watercolors, too, I'm kind of wondering about what I'm going to do about that one, because these are dye-based inks right here. And if I watercolor over this, you know, unless I heat set this really well, it could potentially make the um, the colors run. So maybe I'll do some watercolor pencils or something like that. But I don't know. I'll try to follow along with the structure of the book, though, and do that. But let's wait till these um, um, inks here dry pretty well. They'll be fine for the um, the the chalks and the uh, the colored pencils. But uh, as far as the wet media goes. Let's find in its figure something uh, to do about that. Maybe I'll use some Copic markers or something like that, the alcohol, so that um, going over the dye-based inks, those two um, mediums, binders don't mix, water and alcohol. So I should be able to go over this with alcohol markers, um, with no problem. It's not in the book, but hey, they didn't have, uh, they weren't utilizing a lot of the, uh, the alcohol markers at that time. Okay, so that's my format there. And we'll proceed with the next. All right. Coloring uh, 5A here. It says chalks. All right. I don't have chalks, but I found some pastels. Much like watercolor paints, chalks are easy to blend and have a light and lovely look. Apply the chalk color to the image in small circles. If desired, you may apply the chalk colors using the makeup applicator. You will not have great control applying color in tiny areas, but don't let that frustrate you. Chalks look best when they are smudged and soft looking. If you wish, chalk erasers can be used to eliminate unwanted color. Once you have finished applying the color, 
spray the image with the matte finish sealer to permanently set the chalk. So something like a spray fix. Okay, so I am I'm like stamping for the first time here um, with this technique. Um, and I have found this set. If you don't believe me, then I haven't used pastels or whatnot. You can see this set right here is unopened. I'm guessing I've had this for 25, 30 years or something like that. But I just checked online. They're still out there and for a very reasonable price. I don't know what I got this for, but I think it could have been this I actually won a prize one time from a store called Plaza Pen and Art. It was in, I don't know if it was in Huntington Beach or Fountain Valley. Um, I think it was in Huntington Beach, then it, they moved, and I, I believe it was Fountain Valley. It might have been Huntington Beach still, but I did. They had a like a, a drawing at one time, I think, when they moved, I'm guessing, and I actually won. And uh, it was this or some colored pencils that I won, but see, this isn't something that I would have bought, I don't think, um, because I don't do pastels, okay, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you can see how dusty this is right here, I mean, this has been sitting around for years, okay, so my approach to doing something like this, you know, I, I mean, I have used pen pastels for something at one point in time, um, probably when I was in school, I, well, that's, yeah, that's the only time, and, uh, oh, it would be, like, for, I don't know if it was colored pastels, I think it was just, like, um, maybe black and white, like, in a, like, a drawing class, like, a figure drawing class, life drawing, they called it, and, um, I don't know, um, boy, I, I just, I, I think that it was used for sketching, not for building up color like this. So, okay, so I'm going to approach it in the way that kind of I come to start using most of my media. Okay, so let's grab out some different colors out of the color scheme that we're going to be working in, okay? I'm going back to my own advice here, okay? And uh, approaching it that way. So I have kind of a range of tones here, okay? And I'm thinking this for the road. And then we'll look into um, some other colors. The colors that um, I would be using um, in the tree, I think, trees here, like something like this, and then maybe throw in. One of the good things about this I'm finding just doing this exercise right here is that, see, those are the types of colors that I used in those leaves, right? So I'm thinking about those right back in here. This is going to be a really strange type of um, exercise for me. Um, let's see, let's go into the white. I don't know what the difference between these two are. One looks white and the other one looks white. You know what? They probably have two whites because that's... Well, this is like three whites. Okay, I mean, that's going to be one of the most important colors. And it looks like there's two or three blacks in here too. You know what I mean? Just the most common colors there, so. Okay, well, let's start off with this. All right, now, I, you know, pastels and chalks, I mean, they're, they're somewhat opaque, okay? So the media that's a little bit more opaque than transparent, like dye-based inks, alcohol inks, um, I apply those starting from light tones, and then I work incrementally darker, okay? But with pastels, I think I'm going to start off with the darker tones and then go into the lighter ones, I think, you know. We'll see how that works out here, okay? So, okay, so working with pastels, I mean, it's not a, you know, um, I was going to say it's not a great idea to, you know, go out, you know, and add things in too harshly. <laughs> uh, let's just see how it goes here. I'm not working, you know, used to working with um, such uh, soft media and also that, um, re you know, um, retains the softness after you apply it too. Like it's, it's like 
powder sitting on here. Okay, now the paper that I'm working it with is also very smooth, okay? And, um, you know, in pastels, it's best to have a paper that has some tooth to it. So keep that in mind, okay? All right. So adding this in. I'm finding the look, you know, kind of, you know, from a, an emotional standpoint right here. I'm enjoying what I'm seeing just initially right here. I don't know. And this look. Huh. Don't enjoy it too much, though, Kevin. I already have too many, too much media that I already, uh, gosh, you know, I'm in, kind of invested in exploring, you know, with the foils and all that, but I don't know. Hmm. Well, let's see how this goes, okay? But so far, I don't know. It's not too bad. Okay, let's move. Remember, I'm working backwards here, so let's go to the lighter tone here. Okay, now immediately from one color to the next here, the texture of this one is vastly different. Well, I don't know about vastly. Maybe not in comparison to using something like a dye-based ink or something like that. But this one right here, this next pastel, is um, it's so much harder in consistency. The first one was like applying powder, so, huh, it's kind of interesting. Anyone that's decent at chalks or pastels, you know, uh, it's probably kind of cringing at my use here. But it's a very tentative use. Okay, kind of like so. Um, you might notice my um, retention of some lighter areas in here. Maybe I don't need to do that because I can just go in with white right over the top of it. So, but I'm kind of approaching this in a similar fashion that I do with inks, okay? Both dyes and uh, things like pigments in terms of my process, okay? All right, so I'm going with the lighter tone right over the top here. And I, you know, with, with chalks and pastels, I just, I generally think it's a pretty good idea to, to fill everything in. I don't know about kind of the retention of, um, like, say, the white of the paper. I, I, with chalks and pastels, I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah, and just in terms of uh, um, kind of visual continuity. All right. I don't, so far, this is looking pretty cool. I don't know. And that dirt area down there, it's it's a pretty good texture for that um, dirt. I don't know. There's just this chalky, you know, substance that we're applying here. Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty conducive to make it of a dirt road. I don't know. Okay, so let's try some of these um, tones up on these trees. Okay, now immediately I'm finding that at least this particular color. It's just, I don't know, it's it's so hard. Let's see. Um, it's just so hard that it's really not applying much, if anything, in here. Okay, let's try it in. Yeah, this one right here, this yellow green, it's just not applying. Let's see if this is the same yellow. That looks different than this one right here. This one just looks more like a pale green. Let's see if this applies. Okay, yeah, there's di there's just different tactile qualities to these different um, ones. This one right here almost didn't apply at all. It's a little bit more waxy. This one right here, it's much softer. I feel it grabbing. It's just a different feel when applying it on my paper, okay? I can feel it um, applying and releasing from the stick. The other one felt like, I don't know, taking like a piece of wax and just going right over there. Uh, they're, they're all the same, you know, soft pastels. Now, but re you know, remember, if you're doing this on something paper that's more conducive to pastels, like if, if you know you're going to be finishing off something in pastels, 
then you're probably going to be using like a matte paper as opposed to like this um, satin one, you know. So you're, you know, you're going to have a much easier, I believe, application process. That being said, the fact that I can do this on here at all is bodes pretty well for the entire, uh, I don't know, medium, you know, in, in conjunction with uh, um, the other media that's already been used in terms of dye-based inks here. Okay, so that is that green. Let me leave that one out. Let's see if this one works right here. Yeah, it's the same type of thing. I, I feel it kind of grabbing a little bit more. Oops. Oh my god, look at that. It broke. No big deal. You just use a smaller portion of it. We had pieces breaking all the time. Maybe this one's much softer, you know? So it's applying, right? So, I don't know. Yeah, it snapped. All right. That is that. Let's try this orange-ish one. Okay, the orange-ish one's pretty good. I'll hold it. I'll hold my um, chalk a little bit higher. So I, if I'm holding it back here, or in the, even in the middle, it's probably more prone to snapping. Okay, I'm bringing a little of this down here even though it's uh, kind of more in the foliage type of thing. All right. And let's go to yellow. Now, at this point in time, I'm wishing that I did have this on a paper with a little bit more tooth to it. Maybe spraying this with a workable fixative will allow me to use these other colors on here a little bit easier. A workable fixative um, applies this um, kind of a, a textured surface to this. So it allows you to build up more things like um, pastels, um, chalks, graphite, uh, charcoal, if you're doing like charcoal drawings. So maybe that's a good way to go because I can use a little bit more texture. Okay, bringing some of this warmth, this yellow, down in this area down here. I'm going to use my finger to kind of blend some of the colors. That's what we used to use, you know, in uh, art classes. I was never, you know, particularly good at soft media in general. I was more of a hard medium type of person, you know, uh, detail-oriented uh, media, so things like watercolors and things like that. While I love the look, I don't know, I never really got the hang of it particularly like, well, working with um, um, different types of brushes. I was much better with a, you know, like a fine point type of uh, instrument for uh, detail, but I always love the look, you know. People that can go for real spontaneous types of looks on their pieces. Um, with real gestural brush qualities and charcoal. I always loved it. I only I got it a couple times in class, but I kind of had to be like in the zone. But it wasn't something that we practiced a lot, so you know, I just didn't have a lot of practice in it. Okay, so adding some white down here, I'm kind of adding that light back into this area. Okay. I don't know. It's a pretty good soft look to it, I guess, you know. Um, I need one of those little stomp things. I tell you what, let's use a Q-tip right here, okay? And let's blend in some of these tones. I'm kind of removing some of it, but let's go in like that. And let's kind of layer it a little bit more again. Adding some shadow work in here. Shadow work meaning I'm just kind of making some areas a little bit darker. Okay, and I blended a lot of that out, kind of smoothed it out. So I'm just going back in here and kind of re 
incorporating some darker areas for some shadow work, okay? So you kind of add it in there, blend it, add a little bit more, you know, until you get kind of the texturing that you want. Again, not that I know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about just in general, you know, the types of um, um, characteristics that I'm going after in my pieces. That's, you know, the, the process of kind of a circular motion or circular um, um, application type going back in, adding things, removing things, adding things back in, working through lighter tones, going to darker tones, going back and adding lighter tones again, that type of thing, as opposed to seeing things as like a straight line. First you add light, then dark, you know, or something like that, and just keeping it at that. We can kind of go back in and do other things um, over again. We can reiterate um, in a kind of a circular methodology uh, the things that we want to do. Okay, so here's some blue, adding it in here. Boy, that looks pretty good down there, that blue in there. Not, I'm not talking about my technique either. I'm just talking about the color, um, how that looks on there. Okay, that's blue. Let's see what this little bit of blue looks like around in on the uh, the road too. I mentioned to you know utilizing a little bit of um, cool tones in with your warmer tones here and there for a little bit of continuity, but just kind of visual interest. I don't know if you can see that little bluish tinge right in here, as opposed to it just being you know stark white. Here's you know, a piece of white next to it. I don't know. The, it, it kind of mixes up a little bit of cool within the warm. Okay, now that blue, I, I really like that there. So let's see what we can do is if we can bring some of that bluish tinge into the sky here, okay? All right. Let's go with this other one, this other little darker one here. This is the most dusty um, I've ever had my work area, stamping work area at least, okay. So adding a little bit of bluish tinge, okay. And I'll leave some white up there as well, okay. And coming in with this other blue. The other blue is almost, this one right here is almost acting like an eraser because it's much harder in consistency. So I find it kind of, I don't know, it's like a blending tool almost. Which, you know, maybe it's good, I don't know. And also I'm finding that kind of the more you know, the relative pressure that I'm using on here is determining the amount of um, color transfer that's happening. Okay, let's use a little bit of cotton ball here. In the sky, yeah, that worked. I don't know if it's just completely erasing or if it's kind of blending out. But again, if this was a paper that had some tooth to it, it wouldn't be doing that, like just wiping off, you know? But that little white up there is, you know, it's pretty nice, I guess. Okay, now let's go back into that white. I can't tell if that's white or if that's like a cream. That might be a cream unless... Okay, I think that's a little bit of cream. Let's go into this. I can tell this one's white. And we'll go into that white area. Okay, this white right here, it feels like it has that kind of harder texture. Bit on top of the roof, the visual lead in on the road down here. 
okay, not an expertly applied um, medium, but I don't know, I'm not displeased with this in terms of an overall look. I think it looks pretty good. I don't know. I had a I had a good experience with it. Oh. Um there's my fingers. Um let's take a look at this right here. Let's see. Let me like that. I think it has a pretty nice kind of feel, you know? Um huh. Let's see. Let me do something. Let me do a little tweaks down here. I think this got a little bit too yellowish. Let's go in a little bit of the the green again down here. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I could do. I I, I mean I'm I'm just I'm kind of th sticking to the format of the uh, the book. Stamping for the first time here, but. Um, I'm trying to think if like a spray sealant on top of that and maybe incorporating like paint pens over the top of that might be kind of cool in terms of a, a look. But I, I don't know. I could see myself just doing, you know, some pastel types of uh, coloring in the future. I think it would be good for certain types of um, scenery, okay? Um, something real conducive to that, you know, soft, you know, soft looking appearance, I guess. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, organize this 48 set here of chalks into, um, you know, like full color schemes, you know, going from red, orange, and whatever. Maybe I'll do a video just on that, and I'll show you how I arrange my, uh, my inks and colors and whatnot. Um, you know, to to suit my needs and the way that I work, but I don't know. There's our first uh, thing. I'm much more the, pleased um, the entire process and uh, way of working on this than I uh, I don't know than what I suspected. I didn't think I I'd dislike it, but um, I don't know. I was just really pleased with the way that this paper took this too. Um, like I said, if I was to do something just with um, pastels, I think I would go with the matte paper as opposed to this slightly more smooth one. And I think that would be much more conducive to getting um, kind of a more layers of uh, the chalks. Okay, so anyways, first scene. Okay, coloring method number two, 5B, colored pencils. Uh, one, it is natural to see pencil marks when you use colored pencils. Rather than fight this, Use the marks to add texture to the stamped image. Cross-hatching, coloring in one direction, and then coloring over it in the opposite direction produces interesting results, as does coloring an area with two coordinating colors. Two, colored pencils should be sharpened by hand with a good pencil sharpener. You will find that sharp points and dull points produce different results. Sharp points are handy for coloring small areas, Dull points produce broader strokes of the of color that look softer and are easier to blend. Okay, now in that number one, that's <laughs> something that um, I'm always kind of curious about how kind of people come to came to start using colored pencils without any kind of marks. Okay, I think that looks good, but the big part about colored pencils throughout kind of the history of using colored pencils is to get that kind of texturing in there. It's just like using brush strokes, you know, like an oil painter isn't going to try to do something that looks like an airbrush or something like that. I think it looks good, but maybe to contrast against um, kind of the, the softer, you know, non, you know, kind of textured looks um, would be good, but I wouldn't try to get rid of all textures because that's one of the best things about colored pencils is are those textures. Now maybe, you, you know, if we don't use colored pencils a lot, and I hardly ever do, okay? Now, the, the, the experienced colored pencil user, they might get kind of the, the textures that, you know, would be desired, but maybe if we don't use it too often, maybe someone wants to go for more of that, you know, totally non, 
um, textured look. And I get that, okay? I, I understand where you're coming from, though, too. But I think if we're going to be using colored pencils, it's kind of good to kind of work towards that end of utilizing the media for kind of its strongest attributes, okay? All right, so I have a lot more um, colors that um, can relate to the scene right here, all right? So, oh, I don't know. I, I find that um, colored pencils, I mean, if you use them in a really thick type of application, they're pretty opaque, okay? But the way that I use them in kind of a softer application, um, it's much more translucent. So I think just by and large, I think I'm going to work from light tones and then I'll work darker. But then I might circle it back around and come back in with the lighter ones again. Okay, so that's just my general theory in terms of my approach or my thinking as far as that goes. Okay, so browns, I mean, if we had like a tan, I mean, you can you go in with something like this first. I don't want to build up too much um, color though with lighter tones because this is a soft, I mean, a, it's a, a smooth paper, okay? And I don't want to build up too much wax over something. Um, just because um, when we go back into this, um, over it with other colors, they might not be able to apply very easily if we already have a buildup of the previous colors that we've already used. Okay, so I'm just going into this. This is just kind of giving me a little bit of an inclination about where I'll kind of define some light. I don't know, maybe this one's almost too light for that. Let's go into the next one. Okay, so usually with my lightest tones, I kind of start developing some sort of um, lighting scheme. Okay, so this one's, this is a darker brown, okay, but I'm using it like this, all right? So, okay, so on this one right here, on the covered bridges, and um, just kind of structures in general, I create them using different um, value schemes, you know, from the top left and right. Okay, so this is what it looks like right here, okay? The side of this covered bridge right here is darker than this one, okay? So this one right here has a shadow on it, but the rooftop is lighter, okay? So I am always doing um, kind of just in general three different lighting schemes on my structures so that they look um, more three-dimensional and they kind of reflect, um, you know, different lighting um, situations because light is going to be hitting um, structures in a different way depending on uh, the lighting direction. So in natural light, um, you would get that, okay? So uh, that being said, I reiterate that same type of lighting scheme when I go in with my coloring. Okay, so what does that mean? So if I design a stamp that has a darker edge side to it than other sides, then I darken that side that's dark or darker more than others, okay? So I just follow that same lighting scheme that's already been established in the design, okay? So now here's something on the road. There's not really a lighting scheme established on the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make an area on the road lighter, or a couple areas, okay, lighter than others, okay? So you get this kind of oscillation of light and dark within that space. Okay, now roads in general, I like to have them lighter, okay, as a visual lead-in for our kind of visual destination, okay? So that's what I'll be doing. Okay, so that's that um, brown right there. Okay, and see this one right here? It's a little bit darker and I'll just kind of follow suit. Okay, one of the things I'm finding with this is that colored pencils, you know, from brand to brand aren't created the same. They're, they have different characteristics. Some are softer than others, but even within the same brand, a different color is going to probably be softer than another one. Just, I don't know, the chemistry of that color, maybe, whatnot. This one 
is applying, I'm finding much easier than that previous one for some reason. I'm not an expert on colored pencils by any means. If anything, I'm more of like a, a beginner. Um, and that's the way I would classify myself. So I don't know a lot about different colored pencils, but I, I asked around when I started using colored pencils a little bit more um, about the different brands to, to some colored pencil forums, okay? And uh, some people said, the, yeah, the, the Prisma colors just in general, you know, are really soft in comparison to some other ones. Um, so for me, working on something like this, smoother cardstock, I, I believe that softer um, um, characteristic is allowing me to transfer that on. It, you know, the harder something is on a smooth surface, it probably won't transfer as much um, um, whatever pigment wax over to that. So I don't know. It, it works fine for me. And someone asked me recently, and I said, hey, you know, it's not really a matter of my preference. I just happen to have the Prismacolors um, from way back. These are some really old ones here. I don't know if the chemistry's changed at all. I don't know. Does anyone know that? Uh, that's watching the video now. If you've used Prismacolors like from say 30 years ago, you know, have they changed in chemistry at all? I would imagine probably, you know, different um, production facilities, if it's changed over the years, could have changed. All right, so see that brown right there? Um, you know, I'm creating that shadow and I'm creating kind of an irregular area on top, meaning that it's not just, the rooftop's not all one value, and the side of the, you know, the covered bridge isn't just one value of uh, brown or whatever colors you're doing things with. You, you, you change it around so you vary it so that it just looks um, much richer in the end result by having those different types of values throughout um, a given area or shape. All right, now, the more that I use colored pencils too, the more comfortable I am with getting things like cross hatching and things like that. I think I'm coloring a little bit faster than I was, you know, I don't know, whatever, five months ago, whenever I started playing around with colored pencils a little bit more. It hasn't been very long. But I use the same principles again. You know, it's about kind of the oscillation of light and dark. I'm not really thinking about you know, when I'm doing this. Well, maybe when I first started off using the colored pencil, I'm definitely thinking about the medium. Um, but now I'm kind of thinking more about like, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking about, okay, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking about kind of the retention of light. Or when I'm applying this, okay, what areas do I want to read, you know? Uh, retain some of that lighter area of the grass. Um, where do you want it a little bit darker? Where do I want to create shadows? So I'm not really thinking too much about color. I mean, I am, being that I am working in color, but it's more about kind of lights and darks, you know, and that makes it easier for me, okay? I'm not kind of stressing out about... Um, certain things. I'm thinking about like uh, two um, visual, um, I don't know, whatever concepts in here. I'm thinking about um, basically lighting, which is about light and dark. So it's a, about the retention, okay, as I add in darker forms, okay. All right, so on something like this grassy area, what I'm doing is I'm going in here and I'm going to add some of this darker green that's not adding very much. <laughs> this one's a little bit of a harder one here. But what I'm looking for is I'm thinking about, as I'm applying this, am I leaving enough of that light area of the area that I'm applying it to, okay? 
So just make things a lot easier for yourself. Almost think of it like I, I approach things as if I'm working in black and white, even with color. Okay, so this green, dark green, I'm not really thinking about it in terms of green. I'm thinking about it in terms of like light and dark. It's just a darker green that I'm working with. So I'm watching it as I apply it, how dark it's getting, okay? In a given area, so retain some of those areas of light and you're good. Okay, now that one was kind of olive green. We're getting a little bit darker with this one, okay? But again, I'm just using it in a very light form at first. Okay, and this one's good because it's going on very easily. Again, the last one didn't go on very easy, so I wasn't able to apply much of it, but this one is going on very good. And I'm applying it in some areas, in a very light um, touch at first. Okay. But then I'll go in. So what it looks like I'm doing, I'm kind of going like this. Okay. Some areas a little, little bit harder than others. So that we get that oscillation of light and dark throughout. Okay. It just, it looks a little bit more realistic on, you know, when you have lighting variation on a surface that's not supposed to be flat, okay? All right. That here's another green. Yeah, this one's ooh, this one's really soft. Okay. We'll add it into some of our darker areas along that road. Maybe in the shadows. I am going into that brown of the road too, okay. Otherwise, if you don't do that, um kind of the road and grass seem a little bit kind of unrelated, okay? You want there be relationships between all of your pieces. I mean, you can bring some of this green into your bridge even if you want to, like that, okay? It doesn't read as green, but there's just kind of a little bit of a greenish tinge, you know, in that darker area that relates to the surrounding um, colors. Okay, so here's a little bit of orange. We'll bring some of this into our trees. It's not going to turn kind of that darker green of the trees into orange, but we're giving it that little tinge of a uh, orangish, orangish tone. And see this right here? I'll bring some of this down to this road right here. It's not, we're not making an orange road or anything like that. You can bring it into your grass here just to give it some continuity again with, you know, the background trees. You put it in some of the foreground grass like that. You don't want orange grass, but you might want just a slight tinge of it. Uh, yellow orange, okay. Just kind of warming up the uh, the road a little bit, and yellow. All right, um, let's go into our water area here. All right. <laughs> I like that uh, blue of the with the chalks, uh, that last one. Okay, a little bit of blue on my road, like it did before. Bring some of this down into the grass as well. All right, and I think that should do it. I brought a tinge of blue in the background right there, but I don't think I'm going to do it with this, with the colored pencils. All right, so that is that with the colored pencils. All right, let's take a look and do a little comparison contrast right here. <laughs> you almost can't even tell. Uh, it's kind of interesting with the uh, one that has a super soft medium and one is like all sharp. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like that blue up there, being able to bring those chalks right over the top of these trees, though. Like that. 
and it just creates that little tinge of uh, kind of blue skies with a little bit of cloud back there. But I don't know. Yeah, they don't look very different, although they're very different mediums. Um, it's kind of interesting. All right, so second one down. Oh boy, we have watercolor and pens to come. That should be interesting. Okay, markers 5C. Number one, color large areas using the broad tip of the marker and smaller areas such as the belt on the angel's gown using the fine tip. All right, so they're talking about the double-sided uh, la plumes or tombos that were out at the time that everyone was using. I'm not going to be doing that because I don't have them. I might have a couple of these pens, but uh, not uh, kind of a full range. All right, number two, in addition to the bold color you can achieve with markers, you will enjoy the control you have putting the color where you want it. As you color the printed image, proceed in order from the lightest color first to the darkest color last. Okay, that's a good uh, tip. That way, you are less likely to drag darker colors into the lighter colors. Well, if you want to blend colors, then that's a good way to do it. But, you know, um, people were kind of uh, a little bit more careful about polluting um, pens, especially of these types back then, because they were a finer tip. I do it all the time with the uh, the big, thick 1500 series markers, um, because they're super juicy and kind of, I don't know if they're designed to do that, but they were perfectly suited for that. With these ones, you can't, I don't know, you can kind of roll the, the colors off. Okay, do not go over a spot with a marker too many times that will become uh, the color will become very dark and you will see the marker brush strokes well uh, again with the brush strokes you know uh, I was in art and design classes okay and one of the things with like industrial the people that used markers all the time were industrial designers and those marker strokes were on there all the time I don't know if they're using um, Markers for their comps, those comprehensives, layouts, and whatnot, but the marker look and um, kind of texture, texturing with that was, I don't know, it was integral in the, the look of the piece. But if we're not using markers all the time, you've, you know, and to get those kind of contour lines using the markers, then maybe, you know, you would want to avoid that. But I don't know, I think it was, you know, a look that was an aesthetic that was really important for those um, marker comps. Um, okay, so, man, I can barely tell the difference between the the uh, the, ch uh, the pastels and the colored pencils in some ways uh, between these two, if I just look at it, you know, briefly. But, you know, I think I'm going to take some things learned from um, those chalks and apply that to future pieces. I mean, Definitely that background kind of sky there is a pretty good one. Um, the texture to go with. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so markers. I'm going to use my um, alcohol markers. You can use your Copic markers, whatever markers you have. I'm just using my La Plumes here. Um, I also have another set, large set, by Shuttle Art. I moved that off my desk um, when I did some cleaning, just because um, I had so much stuff on my desk and it was really, um, I don't know, getting built up to the point of clutter. But I can still use those, okay? All right, so um, with these, I do believe I'm going to go from light colors and I'll move in the darker colors and then I'll go back to the light, okay? Now, I can usually alter... Um, my darker colors with the lighter colors using it like um like a blending pen okay if you know what blending pens are these are just the clear ones it's like clear binder whatever it is in this case it's alcohol and that can kind of dissolve and smooth or blend or actually e almost erase the marker colors that you lay down Depending on what type of paper you're using, the more sealed off the paper it is you're using, um, the more the color is laying on the surface. It's surface oriented, so you can manipulate it. Okay, that leads to a lot of texturing and whatnot when you're using alcohol. But I go for that texture. I want texture, 
this is a very textured type of scene right here, okay? But I can get if you're doing like outline types of things where you're just coloring in solid blocks that, I don't know, maybe you don't want that texture showing. But I would say I wouldn't worry about texture too much. Um, I would kind of oh, I don't know, embrace texture, especially when it comes to anything art. Okay, so I'm just going on with this warm tone apricot here. You can use a tan or something like that. But like what I do with um, dye-based inks, um, I lay down kind of a base coat of a very light value of a given hue. Okay, it depends on what color scheme I'm working with. If it's a uh, bluish, you know, cool type of warm, I mean, a cool type of night time, or just cool in general color scheme, then I might use like a very pale blue, something like uh, this one right here. This is called pale blue. You know, it's, it's just barely, it's barely a value. It's almost clear. Okay, that, it looks dry, but it's not. It's just super, super light. Okay. Now, in this case, a lot of the colors are warm tone, okay, in this uh, composition here. So I'm going with um, a warm base coat, okay? All right, so I'm just laying that around. I am being mindful of lighting, okay? I'll have some areas that are a little bit lighter, a little bit darker in some areas. We'll oscillate that um, kind of shading convention here. And once again, just as a reminder, what I'm talking about, kind of some lighter areas on the rooftop, maybe, on the road as a visual lead-in, and some variations on the trees, okay? So, let's go with, uh, let me just grab these out like I showed you with the other media, okay? So, when we do something like this, we can kind of lay things out going from light to dark. You can see it visually as opposed to it being kind of theoretical or whatnot. We'll be using some greens. I Okay, now when I'm using markers, I usually don't go into anything too extreme. I'm usually working with my really light to medium tones. I usually don't go into um, the darker tones because the darker tones, you see, have already been established in the impression, okay? You know, I've already, I already have a shaded um, um, design here. It's not, they're not outlines. These are tonal designs, okay? So the shadows and light in many ways are very established here. So what you're doing is you're just kind of reiterating what's already on the designs. You're, you're kind of helping a shadow form along or whatnot. Okay, now, I mean, you can work with all of your lighter tones first. Let me see. This is camel. It's a little bit darker than the apricot. We can lay that down, check it out, see um, what color it is in relation to um, laying it over another color. Remember, this camel is what it looks like on white paper, but when you're doing it over the top of apricot, over the top of imagery, you know, it might look a little bit different. This one's almost a little bit darker than I want to go with. Um, you know, from one color to the next. Well, let's see. So, on certain types of papers, this paper is pretty absorbent, though, okay? So, I'm going to be mindful about how much color I lay down on here, okay? Because I don't know how much I can blend away using that uh, lighter color going back around with the light ones, or using the blender. Okay, this is another color right here. Brownish gray. This is a color that I use quite a bit, I find. Okay, and we can bring some of this down into this grassy area. Remember, um, kind of visual continuity. Bringing some of the colors from one image into the next color. Even if you don't want you know, this to be a predominantly brown area in here, like in the trees and whatnot, it will kind of blend everything together, even if it's not noticeably or visually brown in here. It's going to be green in these areas right here, 
but they'll have kind of a sublayer of a common tone that's within other um, objects or areas of your scene. Okay, let's see here. Sepia. Very popular color of painters, oil painters, oil painting students. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go into some of this green. Now remember, what I'm doing is I'm doing something like this, okay? I'm not doing like a solid area because I want to manipulate light. I want to describe lighting within a space. And the way you do that is the retention of some lighter areas within whatever area you're applying it to. So don't just color in everything uniformly. Leave some areas lighter, and therefore that becomes light, okay? It's it's really easy. It's, it's a different concept than kind of just filling in complete areas. So it's just, it's not a matter of doing more, it's doing less, okay? And now that's really strange um, if you've come from kind of... Um, the process of filling in whole areas like that rooftop right there I've left some areas lighter on that um, rooftop there therefore that area is being illuminated by you know whatever the lighting that's in your scene okay and remember you don't have to kind of analyze things and say well maybe to an, an extent okay the rooftop is going to be lighter because it, things are being top lit okay but you can just look at the design and you can see where some areas are darker, like the side of this. Rooftop is lighter, so you put more color here. You can see there's kind of lighter areas throughout the trees, darker areas, but just in general, like structures are generally top lit, okay? And all these little areas of uh, grass down here, you have to think about those as being kind of rounded forms. So at the base of them where there is some shadow, you're adding some more shadow, okay, like this. So my process, it looks like this, okay. So look for the darker areas within your forms. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't go over the whole thing in some areas, but just in some areas, just leave them as is, okay. All right, now I'm going over some of these areas in my trees that I applied the brown to, so... It no longer becomes brown, but it's more of like a, a fusion of green and brown because um, alcohol inks are transparent, okay? So the colors underneath are showing through. And you get that nice kind of harmonizing of um, colors and form like this, okay? Now, as I'm doing this, things aren't blending really well, but that's where we're going to go back to the lighter color, okay? So don't worry about that, especially at this point in time, because we're doing more of a circular type of application of um, colors. We're going back around. Now this one's like super bright right here. It's almost too bright. It's really, really standing out. So we'll go back in and mellow out this um, super, it's called lettuce green, okay? So it's almost kind of glowing, but that will be a, a nice um, sub-layer for um, our other colors to come, okay? All right, so I went with that, so let's go back to the melon, okay? Or you can go pale green or whatever. Okay, so I'm going over some of that lettuce, okay? This is kind of muting it a little bit from what's happening is it's that lettuce is super intense and it's a super bright color. So you go back over it with a little bit more of a dull color. Okay. Until you get it to where you want it. Um, if you're doing it on certain types of papers, you'll be removing some of that lettuce too. Okay. 
Let's see. Let's go back in with... Um, let's try this one. This one's jungle green. It's kind of an olive green. And I'll add some shadows in here. Okay. This is really muting out, the, muting the lettuce, but I'm not putting it just where the lettuce is. Just kind of adding some shadow touches. All right. Now you notice our road here really isn't matching kind of the finish work that we've done um, in the uh, covered bridge and uh, you know in the the foliage, the grass, the ground cover, and the trees. So we'll start to address that here. Okay. All right, so this is that brownish gray again. Don't worry about specific colors. If I didn't have these specific colors, you know, I wouldn't be using them, um, obviously. But I would just go for something equivalent. I would just go for some lighter kind of tone. Okay. All right, let's see. That is a little bit harsh. Let's go back in and... Let's kind of blend that out a little bit, okay? Now I'm going to cheat in some ways on some of these pieces here just because no one was doing um, white pigment ink over the tops of things like in a um, foggy type of misty way, okay? I don't know if I was doing it at that time in 1999, okay? Um, but that is going to go in here and remedy a lot of my kind of clunky, maybe, deliveries on, you know, delivery to some of these inks right here and techniques. It kind of mellows everything out and kind of hides, you know, all my weaknesses. Or not, I don't know about all of them, but a lot of them in terms of media application. And where, you know, maybe it doesn't need that, okay? Maybe it looks okay, but it, it'll enhance everything, you know, in addition to kind of hiding certain, you know, technique issues, you might call it, say. Okay, so let's see. Let's add a little bit of texturing, you know, talk about kind of don't worry about avoiding it. We want it to create it. So I'm putting little, some dots here in the forms, okay, on the uh, the covered bridge road. See all these little rocks down here? So I'm going back into those and adding in some additional textures, okay? Now, in going back into some of these areas um, and blending it in, I some of that green is on the road, but like I said, you know, it's, um, and it's all part of the... Uh, I don't know, to me, the aesthetic of the piece. Okay, I am going in with the blending one now, and let's go and blend kind of a negative type of uh, shape back into it, just in terms of removing, you know, and creating light within dark in some ways, okay? You can do that to some extent um, on this paper, but on other papers you can do it quite a bit, okay? It's just kind of mellowing um, some things out as well. It's not removing too much because this is a pretty absorbent surface. Okay, you can really move things around if it's on like glossy paper or glossy cardstock. Um, what do you have? The, the vellums kind of the non-porous types of surfaces. But I think that looks okay like that. It's not too bad. I'm not, you know, a, a marker colorist. In fact, I'm not really any of these things that we've tried so far. And here it is kind of like the the beginning kind of uh, techniques of uh, 
you know, stamping. I do certain things with these things, but not like at a full extent like this uh, most of the time, okay? Like I'm not just only using markers on anything. I'll use dye based things, you know, because I can get areas just filled in so much faster, you know, with a vast, you know, uh, quick application of uh, ink in like in a whole area with uh, dye based inks, okay? But I'd have to say that this is pretty fun. It's almost like a I don't know. It's like a different mindset or something. It's like using a different part of the different hemisphere of your brain or something. That's what it feels like. Okay, so that is that. Now, I'm not going to go in with the markers up here in the sky, I don't think. I could, you know, it'd be good is that, you know, you do this with markers down here and then you hit this area up here with the, with the pastels, you know, to get that light blue in the background. But let's take a look at these right now, just in terms of, uh, I don't know, maybe the techniques and uh, the um, textures that have been achieved. Okay, so we have chalks. Colored pencil and markers. Now, one of the things that, to me, that I'm looking for in this is the pastels in general, and it's, it could be the way that I'm applying them. I could probably get more intensity out of them by doing a thicker application of it. I'm, in fact, I'm sure I could, but I was being pretty conservative with it here to not go for it like a really hard mark. And plus, this isn't the paper for it either. Um, it's just too smooth to get, you know, really um, deep applications of, of whatever given, um, you know, stick I was working with. Um, and some of the sticks are just too hard for this smooth surface, okay? Okay, but just in general, you can see the, the color intensities, um, I think, are increasing with the, um, the given looks. Now, it, it's going to be going back to like this, I think, with the watercolors. I don't know how I'm going to do the watercolors. I'm, I'm going to have to find some watercolors. I have some somewhere. But um, but just in general, I'm going for the same types of aesthetics here. You see that rooftop is lighter in some areas on each of these. We have some of this lighter air. I filled in with the, uh, the colored pencil in quite a bit right here, but the road is a little bit lighter in some areas than others, okay? So you're oscillating light and dark in these areas right here. You have light and dark here, light and dark on the roof here, light and dark on the roof here, light and dark on the path, 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 or road. And then we have light and dark like in this blue section right here in the water, okay? So is on all of your different objects or areas, okay? You retain some lighter areas in each one of those and then you have the sense of lighting in all these given areas, okay? I didn't apply all the same green over this grassy area. In fact, there's like browns and greens within these spaces right here. And the same is going for the trees like that, okay? So it's just as long as you retain some areas of light somewhere within your objects and areas, then you'll create your lighting um, and you're doing it at the same time that you're coloring. You're just not coloring everything, okay? So you just put the brakes on it, okay? And there's no right or wrong. I mean, if I left this bush or, you know, this tree back here a little bit lighter than this one, you know what I mean? It's just, you're just saying that's where the lighting is hitting there, you know? And there's no right or wrong in there, okay? I mean, uh, you know, you can do the rooftop darker up here and you can just say it's a darker roof, okay? So, I mean, you can do that too. I mean, I've seen people do a black roof because they're familiar with a covered bridge somewhere and it has like a tin roof or something like that or, you know, and it, it's darker or it's painted black or something like that, okay? So they're referencing something specific. So you can do things like that or maybe the bridge is painted, you know, it's whitewashed, okay? So it's not going to be this brownish tone, all right? You can do whatever you want, but um, have some areas, other areas, um, illuminated and some darker. Okay, so 
Um, let's get on with the um, watercolors. I got to go find those somewhere, and uh, I don't know. We'll see how it goes with that. I'm not uh, a watercolorist, and I think it might be the first time I've used watercolors on a uh, scene, uh, just like the the pastels. Okay. All right, five D. Watercolor paints. Translucency and ease of blending are the two hallmarks of watercolor paints. It is easy to achieve a very soft, artistic look for, the stamped, for a stamped image when you use watercolor paints. 1. To begin, wet the paintbrush and then make tiny circles in the color, fully loading the brush. Test it out on a scrap paper to see if the color is too strong or too weak. You can always add more water or more paint to adjust the effect. 2. When painting the image, experiment with the brush strokes to see what appeals to you. Use a linear brush for getting into very small areas. Remember, you employ watercolors to create a more unstructured painterly result. Staying in the lines is not necessarily a goal. All right. I could not find a set of cake style of uh, paints. I do have this one that are on, the set that's on sheets, okay? But I figured I'd try out my watercolor pencils. It's, uh, you know, it's not doing, you know, kind of what uh, this book is talking about. It's kind of, I don't know if it's cheating here in a way, but um, I don't know, I, I couldn't, I. I'm not, I didn't want to wait to do this um, type of look here, and um, those sheets, I, I don't know, I didn't want to dip into those at this point in time. So, I'm going to try these watercolor pencils, and if you think I'm lying and I've done this before or whatnot, this is a set of pencils, and just like so many of the other medias I'm using on this uh, um, test, you can see these pencils are brand new here. I just don't do watercolors, okay? I really don't do too much painting either. I do apply dye-based inks and kind of a watercolory type of look at times, but uh, it's kind of a pseudo <clears throat> version of a lot of these types of uh, effects or mediums. Uh, but it's going, what I go for is a much, I don't know, I think it's a, a more methodical type of approach to the media, okay? Um, I don't know, maybe I need to change my, I don't know, view on a lot of this stuff, because, uh, I don't know, I think a lot of the, uh, the effects look pretty good. But, you know, I, I've done, you know, uh, alcohol inks before, but maybe not on, uh, the matte paper, so I'm getting some different looks here even uh, with that in mind, you know, with whatever, some experience. Okay, so I, I've read your um, comments as far as the methodology to use these types of um, uh, mediums here. Um, I need to go back and read it. I, I for, you know, I forgot some of the things, but I got the gist of some of it. Some people were saying <clears throat> that you lay down some water and then you can go into it for one type of look. Other ones, you apply the, the, the media onto the surface, and then you can go back and do some washes. So I got some tips from you guys on uh, both uh, the YouTube video that I posted on this particular set here uh, and on uh, Facebook, okay, when I posted uh, that video. So uh, asking for some tips, and, and thank you all for those tips. I really appreciate it and we'll utilize it. I After I do this one, I'm going to go back in and reread some of those comments too, um, based on what I experience here. I mean, I should have went back and kind of figured, you know, researched it a little bit more. Okay, so immediately as I'm using this, remember I'm using this on a paper that's not ideal for this type of uh, media or application here, okay? So this is, it's a much, um, it, in contrast to the Prisma colors, okay, I'm using these like colored pencils right here, but in contrast to the Prisma colors, at least with this first color here, it's a lot more waxy, okay? So my application of this first color is not applying very 
um, easily <clears throat> because the paper is fairly smooth. No, okay, no, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting a little bit more now. I was probably, I don't know, maybe I'm applying it too much uh, in the spirit of colored pencils as opposed to this watercolor pencil, which as I'm applying it, it's not necessarily what I'm going to get when I apply the water on top of this, so maybe I do need to get a little bit more bold with this, being that I can dissolve some of it. But I'll try to be, I'll do it both ways. I'll apply some of it a little bit more uh, maybe confidently with a bolder mark, and then in some areas maybe I'll go for kind of a lighter application and we can do a little comparison contrast. Okay, so <clears throat> with this first color, I'm kind of establishing a general lighting scheme. I'm going from on this road here a little bit darker um, on some areas, but lighter, darker, lighter, darker, okay? Um, one of the things, too, as I'm applying this, well, okay, maybe not. <laughs> I was thinking as I start working this first color, maybe it's getting a little bit, it's wearing off some of the uh, surface so it's applying easier, but maybe not. I, I just, it seemed like I ran into a little um, part of the, uh, the applicator there and it started going on easier. Maybe not. Okay, let's try this other color. I'm going with the brown. The other one was kind of more of a, like a gray brown. Let me see. Okay, copper beach. I didn't realize the colors were on the, uh, the tools themselves. Okay. All right, I'm just following suit here. I'm kind of following that lighting convention that I established with the first color, okay. I think what's happening is <clears throat> I apply this when I'm on like a real flat area of it. It's applying less because there's more surface. But then as I rotate this around and get to a sharper um, point, it's applying um, more and easier. Okay. Let me see that first color was bronze, I think. Okay. Van Dyke Brown, 55. Or was this the color that I just said? I don't know. Okay, now going back to the paper that I'm using about this not being the great a great surface, as you apply some of this, you know, it gets kind of built up and... I don't know what's in these watercolor pencils. You know, the colored pencils are... It's wax, so... I don't know, is it wax in these ones too? Because wax wouldn't necessarily dissolve in water, right? So whatever it is, um, as I'm building it up here, um, it's not applying as much, okay? Because it's going on something very slick, something very slippery onto something slippery. But as I say that, I got a pretty decent application of it right there. I don't know, it seems to oscillate with them. Um, oh, I don't know, is it resistance or whatever? as it gets a little bit more waxy. It's smoother and slicker. It's, oh, it's, a lot, it's almost like applying this to a sealed um, surface. As the, uh, the surface of the papers um, has a little bit more grain than the surface of, I don't know, whatever this is it's used in here. Okay. I don't think whatever I do in these trees is going to be much of a difference because they're all they've already been colored in for the most part. Okay, now I am concerned about uh, or curious about how um, a little wash of water applied to these will do with my dye based ink impressions. I don't want them to all just get all blurry and whatnot. <clears throat> if I was a watercolor pencilist, 
you know, and I knew what I was doing. And I was getting some blurry types of uh, looks, you know, in the spirit of a watercolor created piece, then maybe I'd have a lot more confidence with it. But let's just see how it goes. But as far as this application right here, this is all pretty easy because it feels like a, you know, I'm using it like a colored pencil. I knew someone that used to use these as colored pencils and they wouldn't apply any water to it at all, you know, and make use of that um, aspect of them. They just liked the, um, the feel of these ones in terms of the uh, relative, uh, whatever, hardness, softness of it. <clears throat> okay, so same type of thing. I'm, I'm trying to retain some of the lighter areas within the piece, okay. Let's apply a little bit more of this green in here. Because <laughs> if, I, if I don't apply enough of the media, when I go back in with a water to dissolve some of these and to make it a little bit more washy looking, um, if I don't have enough of this built up, I'm not going to have very much of it going back into solution and kind of moving around uh, afterwards. So we'll see how it goes. All right. I always forget this little sandbank on the far shore. All right, let's get in here a little bit more. Let's see. <clears throat> I haven't used too much. I haven't used black on the the past. Uh, I don't know. A couple scenes here, but I usually use some of that. If I use it somewhere in a scene, in this case, it's in the foreground here. I usually use it in other areas here. So let's create a little bit more shading in here more of a bolder application of value, you know, to create more um, lighting within the scene. Remember, you create your lighting with the use of um, shade. <clears throat> You're working contrasts. All right, <clears throat> the road. Having kind of this open road area is, uh, you know, it's providing more of a opportunity for additional tone and color. I'm going back to a light tone right here. Just a little bit of different one. It's a little bit more, I don't know, peach, peachish in tone. Uh, just to add another yet another layer of some uh, color. Uh, a very light one, though. I can barely see anything that that's uh, contributing. I think I went with a little bit too much black up here. Let me go over it with some of this. And then we'll put some wash onto it. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Well, this is watercolor, so let me address some areas in the sky. I'll go very light. This is a, well, this is a jade, it's jade green. Oh, huh. well, turquoise-ish. Let me, let me go with this one instead. Let's go with the kingfisher blue. Um, let's see, let's go down here. Right, I'm, I'm trying to kind of go fast with this because this is supposed to be the watercolor, not watercolor pencil technique right here. But again, I, I just don't... I had some tube watercolors, ancient ones, okay, from when I was in my school days, but I didn't want to use that. You know, there's a bunch of, like, se sepia and... I don't know. 
burn umber and whatnot. I, I I wanted to go with you know more uh, colors with this one. Uh, this application, but I don't know. We'll see how this goes. I am, like I said, I am a little bit concerned about the dye-based inks used to print the uh, the impressions. So we'll see how it goes. I don't want those all going back into solution. I'll, maybe I'll try a dry brushing <coughs> touch. And we'll see how much um, that addition of water to these will kind of smooth out some areas. Again, you know, with colored pencils and whatnot, I'm not necessarily going for anything too smooth. I want some textures. I want some soft textures achieved from this. Okay, I'm looking at this in general, and I'm thinking I want a little bit more of a warmer tinge to the... Um, covered bridge, some warmer wood tones in here. It was looking a little anemic, so let's go back in. Terracotta. That would be a good color for this. A little bit more of that reddish tinge to it. Let's put some of this terracotta on our road, our dirt road here. I think I am removing some some of the uh, um, colors that I already laid down in this area. Okay, let me see. Okay, so I'm rotating it around and it's applying more than kind of removing, but it was removing when I got into a very flat area and I was applying that. It was kind of rubbing off some color, which, you know, was fine as long as it's transferring some of the one that I want to transfer. And that whole thing about adding some of this tone into your surrounding area to bring that visual continuity through color. All right. Here's a blue-gray here. Hmm. This one seems a little softer because it's kind of applying quite a bit. Um, and I'm just using a very soft touch to it. So, like I said, there's different um, hardnesses to your uh, different colors. Just, the, I don't know, the chemistry of them is a little bit different uh, at times. <clears throat> okay. All right. I think that will do it there. <laughs> All right. Oops. This is a 36 set of uh, Derwent's here. Huh. Oh, I thought I was missing one. That's just a little space there. All right. I don't remember buying this set either. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. <clears throat> okay, so I have just these different brushes here. This one I've hardly ever used, of any. Um, but di different widths here, so we'll see how it goes here. Okay, so... Ooh. Huh. I'm not sure why there's yellow in this one. Let me clean this one out a little bit. I was probably doing something on... I'll remember what? I don't know. I was probably using it on dye-based ink or something like that. Okay. Now, don't... Uh, I don't know. I, I guess if you like what you see here, then you can get this, but... <laughs> I'm just using this number five just because it's what I had, okay? Not because it's uh, one that I think is, you know appropriate for the look. Uh, you know, I'll figure it out as I go along, or try to figure it out. I'll just, you know, accordingly. Okay, so let's see. Let's go in here. 
and see what happens here. I think I, I think there's too much liquid in here. I'm going to approach it with a kind of a drier brush type of technique first, okay? Just kind of a moist brush. And we'll go in here like so. Okay, it's really dissolving it quickly, okay? It's really going into solution very quickly. And as I do this, it's really blending those um, colors around pretty good, okay? Or pretty easily, okay? Let me take out a little bit more ink here. Let's go into the sky. Now this, um, my impressions of the, uh, you know, the bridge and whatnot were done. Um, I think over 24 hours ago, maybe, maybe not, but they're pretty well set, so it's not too bad. Okay, going right over around here into these leaves. Okay, some of those are going, I am picking up a little bit of the color from those leaves. Not too bad though, okay. Um, I'll just keep wiping it off right here if I don't want some of that green and, or, you know, less green in my sky here. Let's go into the sky area like this. Okay, that's really picking up some of that tree, so. I'm able to go in here and just kind of clean that up, you know, because it's moist right there, so. You can just kind of mop it right off. As this happens. I mean, inevitably, you want some of this kind of watercolory, washy look. After all, that's kind of the hallmark of, you know, watercolors, right? Is that the word? I don't know, the characteristics, the strengths, okay? Going into here like so. All right, now, yeah, it's picking up some of the uh, tones in here, so let me just mop some of it off so I get that washy look in the background, but it's not just sitting there and uh, dissolving, okay? Okay, now the part where I'm really interested in this is right in this road here, okay? This is a pretty dry brush right here, but it really puts that um, paint into solution. So let's move that around here. I'll use a little bit of a different touch here. Oh, I'm really picking up the... Uh, the uh, color from uh, my reeds right around here, so I'm going to be careful about that. Maybe I'll stay away from them. Okay, let's see, let me dab that off so it won't keep going back into that solution. I'm talking about my uh, reeds prints right here. When I'm going over this area right down here, and again, because it's the really smooth paper, um, I'm really <laughs> I'm really removing some of that ink. Let me see, let me take some of this off right here. And let's go into these uh, side areas, okay? So I'm both kind of putting it back into solution, and then I'm doing some additional painting in other areas. Um, because I'm spreading that ink around on the brush like this. Okay, I'm not going to touch any of this area down here. And that area right in my reeds, I am, I, you know, I'm going to have a separate video on the addition of some additional um, media on here in the form of that white pigment ink. That white pigment ink will take care of so many of the different things on here that maybe uh, don't contribute to the overall look here. I am pretty pleased with this. I definitely have to get kind of a the hang of doing this in terms of just the the speed at which um, the inks kind of spread around or the, the watercolors spread around. They really go back into solution. But here's the thing that I'm doing right now. I'm kind of removing some of this media like this and going into some of these bushes and I'm removing some of that ink. Um, to lighten it back up, like on top of some of these rocks, okay, which is pretty cool to be able to do. Um, okay, let's see, far end, yeah, I put a little bit too much 
I mean, I kind of did it with the anticipation of being able to remove some of it or blend it about, but um, I don't know, it's just cool to be able to to watch it happen now. Okay, all right. Yeah, as I do this, it's just like <laughs> really lightening up some areas right in here. All right, so right in here, that area to me isn't great because of that blur. I'm not really worried. I mean, I, I got a couple um, little blades of grass there that are uh, blurred out. But someone mentioned going back into kind of the wet paper, too. And I'm going to try some of that, okay? So this paper right around here is a little bit moist, so... Let's go back in here and just we'll reaffirm some of these shadows that maybe I lost by spreading it out, but we'll get a little bit of the wash, washy look and some of the more, I don't know, kind of defined marks of the pencil. And we'll see if that makes for a really good combination. I'm always interested in textural contrasts within pieces and I don't know, potentially this one, when I think about it, it has maybe some of the greatest potential for um, textural contrast. I mean, when you think of watercolors, you know, and those washy types of looks, that's the one of the ultimate um, kind of depictions of, of a soft texture, right? And very, uh, I don't know, kind of spontaneous looking... And then we can go and contrast it against something that's, you know, a very detailed type of uh, instrument here in, uh, you know, sharp, especially a sharpened pencil. So here's the thing um, that I'm thinking about right now as I do this. I don't want to lose kind of the washier areas by dominating, just going back right over the top of them and totally obscuring them. So I'm going to try to be careful about that. I lost a little bit of the brighter colors uh, within this space. Okay. And let's see if we have now. I got to go back to the black. I, I wish I had a little bit of a darker kind of brown. Um, there are some, but I'd want one that was a little bit more of like an 80%, which they don't seem to have in this kit. So let me just use the black here bring out some kind of deeper shadows or uh, just a little deeper textural marks, okay? I think I can use my acrylic paint pens too just to uh, bring out some of those little details in these uh, forms again. I think that would look pretty good. But we'll just stick with the watercolors for right now. All right, so that is that. Uh, they, you know, I mean, you don't have to give me a break, but uh, please do. <laughs> that was my first watercolor pencil kind of exercise there. Um, interesting um, kind of things developing there. But, okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, there's my watercolor. That blue tones in there, I think that's blended in pretty well. I kind of stopped going up there because, say, I was getting these little tails coming off of, like, uh, some of the leaves. Um, probably where there were some thicker dye-based inks. The dye-based inks will go back into solution when you hit them with water. But they were set deep enough in these areas right in here, I think. Some of it did start blurring out, but then I just hit it with a paper towel. And just kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, halted some of that. 
But you can see some of these areas right here where that, you know, there's that bleed out happening um, within these spaces right here. So just use the paper towel. So there's some different textural um, types of looks within this space right here. I'm especially looking along the road. So let's take a look and just look at, you know, like a contrast with this one. This one's the colored pencil right here. There's some areas like right in here that look really nice that on something like this, I think look fine, but that looks really good in there, I think. Um, the weathered area in here, I don't know. Uh, it, I, don't, I don't know if I have a preference on any of these things. That's the thing. Um, there's just certain areas where you can use certain things for their strengths. But I am into that right there. That, I do like some areas. Maybe, I'd, maybe I should apply a little bit more of a wash to that. This one is the pastels here, okay. They're not vastly different from each other. And this one is the uh, markers right here. So alcohol markers, okay. In contrast. I mean, maybe we can use some of the, uh, I don't know, the watercolors up in the sky. Maybe you do the watercolors in the sky first, you know what I mean? And then you stamp these over the top of it. That would be, you know, much more appropriate um, process right here so that these ones wouldn't bleed. I wouldn't stamp these into the wet area, but you just wait for this to dry in the background and then apply these over the top of that. You know, maybe then you use um, some of the watercolored pencils for some different washy types of things in here, or you just do your watercolors if you have, um, you know, the cake style watercolors or whatever watercolors you do use. And uh, I don't know. It, it hasn't been revealed to me yet um, what I would use where. I'm going to have to think about that and uh, look at all these uh, as a whole and figure out what I would use where. I don't think any of these techniques right here kind of are a lost effort in terms of I don't think I'll ever do them again. Um, I'm getting more into colored pencils, but that was over this last year, but that, I don't know, that watercolor ability, um, if I can get that down um, even more, that would be really fantastic as kind of a ground, a basic um, foundational type of thing to build on. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, with the chalk one, I'm going to spray seal this, but I want to bring in some things like you know, the, the acrylic paint pens to add in some details on all of these. Um, I don't know if I'll use the, the really large three millimeter paint pens or not. I'll figure that out. But this one definitely needs to be sealed off with a spray fix, okay? I, I guess you can use a, like, an, like a gloss on that one too. The, these types of pens will still stick to it. But if I wanted to do anything on the top of this one, like colored pencils, it better be a spray fix so that it has um, more of a texture. I can also spray fix this and build up some additional um, pastels over the top of it too. And maybe we can get a little bit more variation within those trees with that. But I don't know, it should be fun adding in these, um, the different types of things that I like to do in the forms of uh, like white pigment ink. Um, you know, some of them were detailed work with the uh, the paint pens. And uh, I don't know, we'll see. We'll just go from there. Format then, these into cards as well. All right. So anyways, um, four different beginner techniques on all of these um, from the book. Um, and then we'll get into other videos, maybe where we do, you know, the, the heat embossing and some other uh, techniques that are directly from that book and we'll apply it to our scenes and see how it goes. Okay, so anyways, if you hung in with the video this far, thanks so much for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, if you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe if you like to see more of this type of content, and we will see you on the next video.